First of all, thank you so much for coming to summer school. I hope so far you enjoyed. And uh, yeah, after the summer school, you'll have some takeaways that you will bring back home and you will use it in your ongoing or future research. Well, uh, apparently I'm the last speaker and I'm the one between you and finishing the summer school. So uh, let's, let's get it done. Um, my slide is for one hour, so because of that, I will try to keep it a bit inspired, I'd say a call for inspiration rather than deeply dive to mathematics. Uh, if you want a mathematical lecture of mine, you can find it on YouTube, then you have that. But this one, uh, I will not show you equations at all. Um, recently, my colleagues, hopefully, and I, we were convinced that hydrogen is the way to go. And i like to share it with you. Feel free to uh, challenge me. And uh, we'll see if, uh, if it's convincing or not. But I can already say that, at least in Denmark, uh, it seems that the industry, they are in that direction. So they were not waiting for us to say, for Kenya, if hydrogen is the way to go or not. They are already there. So maybe it's good to then uh, to also academia to be in that direction a bit and make sure that that direction will, will happen optimally, right? So today I'm going to talk about business model for hybrid power plants. Why business model is important? Because without having a good business model, the new technology will not be adopted optimally, right? That's pretty important. And when you work with companies, with industry, business model is the most important thing they want. And I would like to share what yesterday Ram said. Also, he said that these days you are more focusing on industry applications. It's also something that I started recently, a bit more working on industry applications. Of course, big thanks goes to, to my colleagues at ETU that they are helping me with that. Good. I'll try to be fast and finish everything in, in one hour. Uh, whatever I'm going to say, uh, all the credits of that goes to my wonderful colleagues, Erica, she's not here, I'm here, she's preparing the Friday bar, together with Yannick, Alice is here, and Lesia is over there, she's the lead organizer, organizer. and three wonderful ongoing and former Master students Manuel, uh, Marco, and Amy. Good. Uh, what's happening in the, this is a uh, Denmark map, and you see that the locations that already electrolyzers are being installed or will be installed soon. And uh, the plan is to have four to six gigawatt electrolyzer in Denmark by 2030. Do you have any idea what is the current peak demand in Denmark? How much it is? 46 installed capacity for electrolyzer. Electrolyzer for power system is a demand, right? It consumes power to produce hydrogen. So it's it's a load, it's a demand. What is the peak demand today? Any rough idea? Pardon me? 10? 5? It's around 5 to 6. And the plan is that by 2030, it means that in seven years, we are going to have four to six gigawatt more load for the power system. We are doubling the, the power load for the energy system uh, in seven years. That's huge. And think about all infrastructure, for example, for grid that we want. Uh, so, why power to X? Let's have a debate. Why do you think hydrogen is important? Is it a hype? Or no, it's, it's something that we really need that. Some of you already asked me during, even before, I mean, uh, during the week, why do you think hydrogen? So what, what, what do you think? Yes, uh, Amy? Uh, I think that some processes that we need to create 
So you are saying that there are some processes that for that, for their decarbonization, we need hydrogen. Can you give an example of those sectors? <laughs> okay, chemical industry. That, that's good. Heavy transport. Can you give me an example of heavy transport that maybe hydrogen plays a big role? Uh, Kim? Yeah, shipping. Shipping. Uh, you know, one of the biggest, largest shipping companies for container transportation is in Denmark, MERS. Right? You have heard of it. And maybe hydrogen is the way. If we make if we produce hydrogen from green power and then convert hydrogen to methanol, and I was talking about MERS, they see e methanol as their future fuel, then fine, then we are making MERS green. That's a big step to the carbonization of our planet. And you can have other examples as well, but, but MERS is a very, very good example already. And they are in that direction already. So we don't need to convince them. They are there. Not rich there, but they are in the direction. Any other reason? Remember what Lucas said, uh, the first uh, industrial speaker from Orsted, Monday? Do you remember what she told about the plan for extra offshore wind power in Europe and in Denmark? Energy Island. Pardon me? Energy Island. Yes. What about the capacity? Do you remember what capacity she said about the new potential, the potential for extra offshore wind only in Denmark? For 40 gigawatts offshore, wind power we can have in Denmark. What is the peak load in Denmark? Four, five. What is the potential for offshore wind in Denmark? Four, ten times more or eight times more. Okay, we, have, we are going to have huge excess wind power. We want to have more and more excess wind power. Or we can say that, okay, we are there enough, we, we don't want to have more wind power. Wind power. So what, what should be the strategy? What can we do? Do we have huge batteries to be able to, I don't know, store 30 gigawatt wind? No. But hydrogen could be the virtual storage for us, right? And also, look at something more. Great, transportation, yeah? Okay, it's very expensive to invest in transportation infrastructure if we like to transport electrons. But molecules, we can transfer, transport them more easily. It's cheaper. Okay, so that's the second reason, right? To be able to have more and more integration of wind power. We can transfer it to hydrogen, then hydrohydrogen, or to, to ammonia or methanol. Then we have it, then we can uh, transfer it, transport it for, for any industry that we want. We can go and decarbonize the shipping sector. That, that's a huge step towards the capitalization. Is there anyone who would like to challenge me? Yes, I have a question. Do you, yes. think we'll, do you think it will become a hydrogen based economy? Is that the accelerating or an e uh, um, What I was talking with Maersk, they were clearly saying e -methanol. I don't think, I, I'm not a chemical engineer, so don't challenge me in that direction. But as far as I'm hearing from chemical engineers, methanol is the way to go. And do you know if, for example, ships can be retrofitted in some way to yeah. do that? I guess so, otherwise they don't go in that direction. But I'm not expert in that. I am, I'm optimization person, power system, market. So don't push me towards chemical engineering. Yes, please. Maybe not very chemical uh, engineering related, but um, hydrogen already has this, I don't know, 30% efficiency over the whole chain or something. If you add the step to the e methanol, how much worse does that get? Yeah, that's good. That's why we need business model to see if it's worse or not. And it seems that, yeah, it, it will be. By the way, remember that also the technology is still being more and more mature. So here, this building, the big one, the growth. Uh, the, the, the brown one, it's our colleagues, D2 Energy, they are working hard, and maybe they are the leading department in the world, 
building uh, solid oxide electrolyzers. And it's reversible, you can convert power to hydrogen and then use as a fuel cell the same asset, making it again electricity. It's gonna work in a very high temperature, 700 degrees, and it seems that we are already going there. There is a very big company in Denmark called Patsu. They are by design, they make product as chemical catalysts, but whatever they earn, they invest half of it in solid oxide electrolyzers because they think that it's gonna it's gonna work. So yes. This is still progressing, but I think we are going to be there. Yes? Uh, so, so one thing about the shipping is that, um, of course, like, on a global scale, it all seems to work. But yeah. in the end, uh, like, from a centralized perspective, that works. But in the end, for example, the, the ship is needed to, needs to, to, yes. to be transported on hydrogen. Yes. People, some Not hydrogen, uh, methanol. And no. already, if you check uh, my I'm advertising them a lot. I'm not uh, working with them. So. Uh, if you check their website, they are already signing contracts with imethanol green providers in the US, in a huge volume, in Egypt, in Spain, in Portugal. So already yeah, they like are the building the their locations. Yes. That are inland barges, yes. that is privately owned by the shipper. Yes. So they need to make investments. Yes. Yes. That's not something they will be willing to do without any yeah. financial incentive because that's too much risky for them because that's their whole pension. That's their ship. That, that's true, but already the big companies like Merce, they are investing in green fuel infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Or, for example, with Orsted, the company that Luke came from, uh, they already uh, signed a huge hydrogen purchase agreements for the next 20 years. So it's it's happening already. Yes. Uh, just to challenge you. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, sure. The thing is, power to X will work within an ecosystem, an economic ecosystem, uh, and maybe that it will not uh, cause a re reduction, for instance, in energy costs, uh, since we're using more renewable energy. But maybe it will be uh, a, a better avenue for investors. To play the market, clean energy to produce hydrogen, save the hydrogen until it's time to like buy demand, sell the hydrogen for high prices. Energy. It's like other commodities, right? It's not a new story. Also for gas, we have that. For oil, we have the same thing. So it's not a new story what you're saying, and I fully agree with you. And also storing hydrogen gives you further flexibility than electricity, right? But yeah, I I, I share your comment. That's true. Yes, please go. So I put it in there. I do the green exports as well. I do the carbonized sectors like yeah. um, and then the fatigue and like heavy transport and so on. For the electricity, you can end up to some part of the grid, like because you could have a lot of the criticism on hydrogen is like the efficiency, market efficiency to get the electricity and back is very low, it's like maybe like forty percent or so. But if you get like very cheap renewables that you probably keep doing, then it's fine. Like if you cost if you cost the price as much. I, I fully agree with you, exactly. Remember that we are gonna have excess weight power. Our alternative is just to spill or not to have it, right? We are not buying electricity when the electricity price is very high. We are talking about a condition that we are gonna have huge excess amount of wind power. What can we do it? We can make it hydrogen. Efficiency is not perfect, no problem. Because the electricity is cheap, right? If you have to use it with power. My, my, my point is like, I think the point is how much hydrogen makes sense. So like if you're, yeah. so if you're completely that should be open directly, then another twenty percent is going to come. How much it should be? That's a big question of the companies today. It should be optimized. I don't think we have an answer for that. We have to design mathematical models. We have to have PhD students, postdocs, great minds like you. And decide how much hydrogen facilities we should put. I, I, I fully agree with you, if, if that answers your question. Last question before I move, otherwise, I, I gotta talk all one hour about it. Would you think that this hydrogen would be useful to CO2 factory made like electric Yeah, uh, the other day, again, we were talking about mass. They are looking already for biogenic uh, carbon resources, making sure that whatever they are going to produce at the methanol is in this thing too. Okay, I would like, there is also the third reason. Um, 
Many of you also are working on demand response, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you work on demand response to make the system, the, the power system flexible. And you, you like to provide uh, flexibility. And how you are going to sell your flexibility? You sell it in different uh, frequency regulation markets, right? And you have to do, you have to solve a lot of challenges to be able, from an aggregator's perspective, to put a lot of, I don't know, demand response units, DERs together, make it a proper flexibility product, and sell it in different flexibility markets, right? Let's say that you have, I don't know, 50 thermo thermostatically controlled loads. They have rebound effects, a lot of complications. They have different preferences. You have to put them together, make it a nice flexibility product, and sell it. A lot of complications. Electrolyzers, they are already flexible. Loads. They are fast. And they don't have any complications like what PCL says. So also you, from, from a flexibility perspective, you can see them as flexible loads that can sell flexibility. Um, does that mean that you are willing to like, not drive in times where wind power production is slow? And I understood that so far, the required run time, so to say, in order to change the yeah, but we are going to talk what kind of, I, I will, I have a slide, what kind of flex, we have to talk what flexibility products we are talking about, yeah. right? And that, that will answer, I will answer it soon. Good, let me move on. So that's a fantastic uh, slide that my uh, former master student Michael created. So that's what we talk about, we mentioned about hybrid power plant. So, uh, let's see, it works, yes, electrolyzer is in the hot. So you have wind farms, uh, you can sell uh, wind energy either to the grid or consume it by electrolyzer. Can you buy power from the grid for your electrolyzer? Can you do that? Can you buy power from electricity from the grid and consume and make hydrogen? Physically, yes, yes. by regulation. Have you heard about new EU regulation, RFNBO, uh, set last February? Yes, to be able to call it green hydrogen, you should have at least three different conditions. Otherwise, you cannot fly from the grid, right? So one is that, I don't remember correctly, but if uh, the price is less than 20 euro per megawatt hour, you're allowed to buy, otherwise you can't. That's one. The other one is, there should be some wind power <laughs> spillage somewhere. Then you can buy. So there are operational conditions that EU let electrolyzer to buy power from the grid, otherwise you can't. There's the third one that I don't remember. But just Google RFNBO and you'll find it. Okay, that's why here there is only uh, electricity going from wind power to grid, not the other way around, just to make the, the life simple. And then we have uh, electrolyzer, they can produce hydrogen. Also, they can provide together with battery, if you want to provide very, very fast frequency services, then you can sell it to frequency markets. What FCR is, I'm going to talk about it soon. Uh, then uh, to, to be able to to store hydrogen or to inject it into trailer, you need to compress for the compressor hydrogen, right? That's why you need compressor. And for compressor also you need a, some some electricity to be able to work. And then either you store hydrogen or you inject it to tube trailer. Okay. Please. So the electricity markets are of course deciding to create this electricity properties yeah. electricity which is very different from hydrogen. So do you see that, for example, hydrogen, that, that you don't have all these different markets in time, or that you think it will be because, like, how got, do you think all this market structure look like? I, I got to talk to that very oh, soon in one of my, yeah, that's all about portfolio management problem. Yes, true. Good. Um, what are the products of this hybrid power plant? If you are the owner of this plant, what are your products to sell? Electricity, you have wind farm or you have uh, PV, hydrogen. What are the other, pro is there any other product you can sell? Flexibility, different services of, of flexibility. I'll talk what, what services. 
So power, hydrogen, PSO services, the frequency services, we, I'll talk about that more. And DSO services if your plant is connected to distribution grid, right? If not, no DSO services. DSO services like congestion management, right? Good. TSO service, I can only talk about TSO services. Imagine our plant is directly connected to the transmission level. Good. Uh, this is how uh, European market is, right? So I'm trying to answer a bit of your question. So today, uh, I hope you passed some market course. Uh, that, that's from my master course. So uh, in Europe, we have they have an intraday markets being uh, cleared by market operator. In the case of Nordic, it's more cool. While uh, the TSO services, the reserve markets, and then the balancing market, they are being operated by national TSOs, right? In their markets, and again, in Every, every country has their own TSO. In Germany, how many TSOs do we have? Four. Okay. Uh, what are their names? Good, good, good idea. Okay. So, so just to say that we have different markets, electricity markets, and their operators are different, right? So if it's TSO, reserve market and balancing market, it's TSO. If it's their head and intraday market, it's, it's the market operator, right? Good. And you're talking about this one. If you're going to sell flexibility, you're going to sell it in the PSO markets. Good. Uh, what does this figure say? Many of you also working on dynamics, right? What, what does it show? What, what is the blue area? What is the green area? <laughs> Different synchronous areas, right? Are their frequency different? No, everywhere 50 hertz. So what is different? They are not synchronous. They are not synchronous, right? The green area and the blue area, are they connected? Yes, by, HP, by, by AC lines? No, by DC lines, right? Okay, why Denmark is very special here? Because Denmark, mm -hmm. half of it, a part of it is a part of UK1, which is a, a part of continental Europe, the blue, and DK2 here, the Copenhagen, it's part of uh, DK2, the Nordic area. Right? So, and again, it, the NHK has a very specific position. They are running two different markets, flexibility markets, in DK1 and DK2. What are they? These are different products. So if you are coming from, I don't know, France, Switzerland, the, uh, the continental Europe, you have three services, right? Uh, you have three services, FCR, where is FCR, AFRR, MFRR. What are they? What is FCR? What does it stand for, Q? Frequency Containment Reserve. Okay, is it the fastest one or is it the slowest one? Primary reserve, fastest one. What is AFRR? Automatic frequency. Okay, good. That's the secondary reserve, right? And then we have MFRR. That's the manual one, right? Good. That's that's what you have in continental Europe. What is this one then? It's what we have in the Nordic system. In the Nordic system, the Nordic area, we have more products. Why? We have Two types of FCR, FCRD and FCRL. This stands for disturbance and it stands for normal. Mm -hmm. Also, we have something called FFR, fast frequency reserve. Mm -hmm. So even faster than FCR. You're talking about flexibility services, right? Mm -hmm. So why do you have more services here in the Nordic area? The Copenhagen. Variability in wind. Pardon me? There's more wind generation. We have more more penetration of wind. Yes. It's it's low inertia. And the second reason, also have, it's similar. You have, you have less inertia. A small system, high penetration, low inertia. For that, you need, it's the same also in, uh, in England, right? So also you have FFR there. Good. That's a, a slide I stole from Elegant, our Danish TSO. So it shows that, okay, in DK1 and in DK2, continental Europe and also uh, Nordic, what different services you have in terms of the speed and the specifications. I would like to go in details now. Uh, again, another slide that I saw again from an agreement, transport trend. So it shows that what facilities, what technologies, they can produce different 
uh, different uh, products. So here we have electrolyzer. Electrolyzer already provide, can provide FCR. FCR is the fastest. If you can provide FCR, it means that you can also provide AFRR and AFRR because it's the fastest. The same here in DK2. Electrolyzer is, where is it? Ah, it's here. You can provide FCRD. FFR, can you provide? Not a lot. But if you are equipped, combined with battery, you can. Right? So you see that electrolyzer, hybrid power plant, can already participate in all markets. Except FFRR, FFR, but if you have battery, you can also participate there. Okay? Uh, I'm a market person, I'm not dynamic or whatever. Why, why I'm talking about this stuff? Because every of those products, it's a revenue, potential revenue stream. You can earn money there. Each of those flexibility services has its own market. And all of them are being sold or uh, cleared by yes. So every every company has its own market, flexibility markets, and the yes order, right? This is one from Denmark. Oh my God, you see, we have many, many markets in different points of time that you can sell flexibility services there. Is it just for electrolyzer? No. Are you working on demand responses, on energy communities, on anything that they are flexible? You have to um, make proper flexibility products. Sell it there. You can earn money. Okay? So, funny things from Denmark. For example, uh, FCR and FCRD here in Copenhagen, DK2. You can sell it in D-2 as the capacity. You can sell megawatt, not megawatt hour. You sell megawatt. And also, there's another market, the same market in D-1. It means that the TSO buys capacity in D-2. And if later realize that it wasn't enough, it's going to buy again D-1. Always happens? No. The one D minus one is optional. Now put yourself in the position of a electrolyzer or demand response aggregator, whatever. You have to decide D minus two, how much you would like to participate, self flexibility, D minus two. Do you have other option? D minus one, but you don't know it's going to happen or not. Are their prices the same? No. And interestingly, it's also PIC. It's not going for uh, <laughs> so, Can you please speak up? Does it, uh, does moving like regulation and so on affect the efficiency or lifetime of the? Of course, it can. Yes. Good question. I will answer. I, I promise. I know you are coming from Tesla. Battery degradation is important. I'll talk about. I I know where. Why that question comes from? Yes, please. That's another. Uh, this table you have to read it carefully. Uh, for some, for AFRR, sorry, for MFRR, because it's a big volume. Yes. For FCR, it happens, but since it's asymmetric, up and down, usually they cancel out each other. Yes, you will, but it's not a huge amount, right? So there are a lot of details. I, if I like to teach all the things and the details, I, I need one hour. So you have to complain this. Yeah? I, maybe next time, five hours. I, I'm kidding. Sorry. So <laughs> uh, I like to move on, but there is a lot of details. I'll be very happy to, to, uh, to answer offline if you have more questions about details. But there are a lot of details there, right? Just I like to give you the big picture. Uh, yeah, you asked about the uh, degradation or whatever. This is the historical data. From, from Finger, Finger, uh, Finland, uh, TSO, they are very good in sharing data. Can we use this data for DK2? These are data from Finland. Yes, they are in the same area, right? Both of them Nordic area. So the frequency in Denmark is the same as in Copenhagen, so no problem. So this is FCRN when uh, the frequency was between 49 and 50. So, so this is the activation. Uh, per unit of nominal. And this is one we are over frequency between 50 and 50.1. And you'll see that it happens a lot of times. This is from 2021, beginning of 2021 to almost, yeah, end of 2022 for two years. And you see that FCRN, if you produce FCRN, always you are gonna be activated. 
If you are the battery owner, if you have a Tesla, are you going to participate in FCRN? Are you? Most likely not. Then your battery will die after some time because of the degradation, right? The same story for electrolyzer. How is this electrolyzer degradation is? We don't know yet. Our, our friends here, they are working on that. Uh, but what about this? FCRD up and down. So FCRD up only if it is being activated if frequency is between 49.5 and 49.9. It means that the system is in a disturbance situation. Is it happening very often? Is it happening very often? No. Right? So as a battery owner or electrolyzer owner, are you going to produce this? If the price is yes, definitely. It's not going to be well, uh, activated much. Is there a question? Yeah. Yes, Marcia. Is the scale of the top to the y-axis is it wrong? No, it's it's the nominal. So uh, no, not not the last or the first two. The first Should two. Should that be zero point zero five, or is it? Yeah, it's between minus zero point four up. Because the numbers don't. No, no, it should be up to one, right? It should be up to one. What is the question? <coughs> it's okay. Yeah, good. We can we can do. Uh, good. So we talk. Now this is the price. Price is important, right? So let's see what the prices are. Not for activation, just for capacity, for booking services, right? And then you see, for example, what happened recently. Uh, for example, the blue one is the price for FCRN. A lot, almost 400 euro in some hours. What is the orange? Orange is FCRD down. White here because it's a new product in Denmark. It, uh, our TSO introduced this product in the beginning of 2022. And you see what FCRD down price is? It's huge. Are you going to be activated a lot? No. What is the price? A lot. Is it a good market? Definitely. So that's why a lot of startups these days in Denmark, they are insanely invest in batteries. In yeah, other technologies to participate in FCRD because they are not being activated much. Price is very high. Is it going to happen uh, in, in the next two, three years? Who knows? It's a risk. We don't know. Are you following me? Here? I have a quick question in relation to Germany. We saw that the liquidity of the intraday market did increase like a lot, a lot. So we didn't see like an increase in the equal balance in reserve. Was there a difference? Of course, there might be different stories in different markets, right? So remember, there are national TSO markets, right? Country by country might be different, so for sure. So you didn't see something similar? You had like an increase in... No, no, you see that insanely what the price yeah. are. That's, that's the historical data. Okay. Good. Uh, portfolio management, Let, let's get back now. Now you are the owner of this flag, right? So input data. So, you need to forecast price for tomorrow because you are going to bid in the day ahead market. You are going to sell your, you can sell your wind power in the day ahead market. So, you need to forecast it. Imagine you are a price taker. Even I'm not thinking of complications of making it price maker, right? Like what Kwame you uh, talked about, right? Uh, okay, balancing market. So, it's a wind power, so you may need to kill your imbalances if electrolyzer doesn't do that. So you have to forecast also balancing one. Also recently, Denmark switched from two prices scheme, the balancing setup to one price. Do you know what they are? One price scheme, two price scheme, the balancing. Okay, it means that now you can arbitrage between the end and balancing markets. So even balancing market might be profitable for you, right? Uh, and also, you need to forecast your wind power, so only for electricity. Input data, that you, you already saw that there are many markets for flexibility. Oops. Uh, so again, you need to forecast them. Are you, do you like forecasting? Are you looking for a good research direction? Would you like to earn money, have your own startup? Forecast as the service market price. In short term, in long term. Many companies they are willing to buy. Okay? So, also my business advice too. Uh, hydrogen price. Back to the question uh, Do we have a market for hydrogen? No. Recently, at least for now, it's hydrogen purchase agreements. So, luckily, that's the only one which is not uncertain. At least you can make contracts and you know the, what the price will be. 
minimum hydrogen demand, right? For example, in a HPA, hydrogen purchase agreement, for example, Eva Fuel, I don't know if you saw in Copenhagen, there are some hydrogen taxis, Eva Fuel, right? And uh, Andrea and Alice, they are working with Siemens Kamesa. They have a site in the middle of Jutland. They are producing hydrogen, Eva Fuel buys. And then there are uh, taxis in Copenhagen working with hydrogen. So for them, you cannot say that, okay, sorry, there was not, uh, no wind blowing, so there is no hydrogen today. You have to provide them at least a minimum demand of hydrogen per day, right? That, that's the input data. And then tube trailer availability. You don't have transportation yet for hydrogen. There are three tube trailers. They go there, and then whenever tube trailer there, then you can inject uh, hydrogen there. Always there is uncertainty. Maybe, I don't know, there is whatever. Tube trailer is not there. Or for example, in summer or in winter, their capacities are different. Right, because of the ambient temperature. So there are also a lot of the answer in this here. So what I'm trying to say is that you have input data, except hydrogen price and minimum hydrogen demand. Everything is answered. You are you are gonna make decision now optimization. You are gonna make optimization, you are gonna solve optimization problems while everything you have a lot of uncertain sources. Right? To make what? To make the scheduling decisions. What are the scheduling decisions? How much to sell in the AF market? How much to sell in AFRR market? How much to sell in MFRR market? How much to sell in FCR market? How, how much hydrogen to produce every hour? And what is the objective function? Maximize, Maximize profit. Right? That's why the, call, the title is Business Models. Good. Any challenge? You learned from Kwame's Lee's lecture, from Alessia's lecture about VRO, a lot. What is the challenge? A lot of uncertainties, right? Can you tell me? Can you tell me a bit in more details? What kind of challenges do we have about uncertainty here? Can we produce five scenario from for each of them, combine them, solve it? Are we happy? Are we going to earn the highest profit? Yes? I mean, the prices are highly uncertain. No regard. Pardon me? The prices. The prices don't have electricity. Yeah. The prices don't have electricity. We have no idea how the market is going to go. Yeah, that's true. So making an investment decision now. No, I'm, here even I'm not talking about investment. Even imagine you have these assets. You are making so decision for the day after. Yeah, the price are uncertain. The production is uncertain. Everything. There are many uncertainties here. Production, price, everything. Even the demand. You don't know if the tra trailer will be there tomorrow or not. So, what are the challenges? A lot of uncertainties. Yes, please. Also, the decision that you will take will influence the market. Ah, let's say we are price taker. Simplicity. Right? Even I'm not thinking of that. Uh, high dimensionality. Many uh, potentially correlated sources of uncertainty. You already mentioned that. Non-stationarity. We already seen that uh, if if the environment is non-stationary, you are your your ability to learn from historical data is very limited. Maybe even historical data might be misleading because the environment is changing all the time. And especially it happens for ancillary service markets. You saw the trend, right? If you can't, if you generate your scenarios based on information you have a year ago, it doesn't show have the market it is now. Your uncertainty is non-stationary. Right? Uh, then lack of enough historical data. As I told you, Denmark just in November 2021, they changed the balancing scheme from two price to one price. Then we don't have historical data anymore. All the historical data you had was under different regulation. Now we have a new market. Not new market, new market regulation. Right? And conditionality. Your distribution of your forecast error depends on the point forecast, right? So I, I wouldn't like to explain more that. So you have a lot of challenges here, and for all these challenges, you have to try, you have to develop a nice stochastic optimization problem and solve it. And you cannot solve it for 10 hours. You have to decide very fast, right? Good. Any questions so far? Are you convinced that this is a tough problem? You are not? No, yeah.
Ah, you've heard that problem. Uh, that's <laughs> good. Uh, uh, as, um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, the, the amount of PSOs expected for volume is going to incubate a lot to uh, increase. We also see uh, potential or... Uh, even you can put, even I didn't put, thank you for mentioning that, even I didn't put infrared market yeah. as a potential, yeah, yes. You have a lot of ways to even increase the dilution in the complexity of the problem. Let's also put intraday market. How is the intraday market in, 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 in Europe? How is it different than their head market, for example? It's continuous. It's continuous. A lot of challenges there. So you can make decisions at any point of time, one hour, yeah, from the day ahead market until the market, up to 15 minutes before the real time. You can change your decision at any moment of time if you make a bid and you are matched with another bid. So you can see what, how much of complexity we have here. Any other challenge? Not about answer KT? Modeling, yeah. modeling, modeling of what? The yes. plan. Okay, we have, uh, why do you think it's tough? Any idea? Ahmed, right? What, 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 what kind of problem we have here in terms of modeling? I guess that it could like that, especially if, yeah, as you mentioned, you still can see how, how to manage the degradation. Oh, cool. Okay, okay, that's a good one. But uh, a bit even more obvious than that. Well, I'll just say. I'll just say. Okay. Uh, good, that's, that's it. So that's the efficiency curve of, the, uh, of electrolyzer. It's nonlinear. What does it say? Don't, don't look at the blue one yet. Just the black one. Uh, y axis is uh, efficiency. So, how, what, uh, the kilogram per megawatt of hydrogen you, you produce. And the x axis is loading of the electrolyzer. For example, if your electrolyzer is 10 megawatt, so what means that you are consuming 10 megawatt. And if you are operating at 0 0.4, it means that your electrolyzer is consuming 4 megawatt. What do you see here? Nonlinearity. Depending at what operating point your electrolyzer is being working, your efficiency is different. If you operate your electrolyzer at full capacity for every one megawatt power, it's going to give you 17.5 hydrogen, kilogram of hydrogen. But if you consume it, sorry, if you operate your electrolyzer, for example, in 30% of its uh, capacity, then for every megawatt power, it's going to give you almost 20 kilogram hydrogen, non-linear. And even this is very simplistic. If you add pressure and temperature variables on top, even different. So here we assume that pressure is constant, temperature is constant, right? Uh, why is it, why we are working on, on this problem this state? Because at least uh, there are many companies active in Denmark. All of them, they want to maximize the profit. All of them, they are convinced that hydrogen should be or could be the way to go. And all of them, they like to solve this kind of problems. Okay? So very high. Like national record. It's high. But at least you know that they are investing in that. I'm not saying I'm against machine learning. Also, I like it. Uh, this is the uh, area that Alice and Andrea, they are working on that side. Uh, I will show you a picture if you reach, maybe you will not, there will be no time to reach that point. So this is site of Siemens Gamesa in close Bohanda in the middle of uh, Jatkan in Denmark. So wind power, electrolyzer, batteries, and the uptake where the two trailers should come here. And yeah, that's, that's the data we have, and we are trying to maximize their profit. Uh, Yes, and when Alice maximizes their product, she will be graduated. Uh, uh, I have only 30 minutes left, so I'll be very, very fast. Just to give you a big picture. Did you, did you see a case where the hydrogen market would be much more profitable than the electricity market that now is zero? We don't know. We don't know. That's a good question. That's a lot of uncertainties we don't know, right? So today, if I'm not wrong, the average, there are a lot of confidential data that even they don't provide it me. But uh, my, my impression is that today, based on the contracts, there's no market, right? Contracts that, for example, Orsted and 
Merce, they are signing. I hope I'm not saying something wrong. The, the price is about two euro, two euro per kilogram hydrogen, right? Am I saying that? I hope. So, so for black hydrogen, it's two, right? So for green, it should be higher, but how much even I, I'm not sure that I know, you know that. Right? So is it going to be more? Five euro per, who knows? So far, everything is bilateral contracts. There's no one market for hydrogen yet. Maybe in 20 years, there will be, who knows? For natural gas, we have European market. For heat, we have in Copenhagen a market in Copenhagen. So I will not be surprised if we have uh, a tool market for hydrogen except for it. Today, do we have no? Okay, uh, is someone, will someone be in Belgrade next week? Oh, I'll see you there. So, Manuel will present his paper there next week. I like to be very fast. I'm sorry for saying that. So, what, what Manuel, Erika, and Andrea they did, uh, they tried, okay, if you have this kind of things, the easiest way is that you use linear, piecewise linear, piecewise linear approximation, right? I don't know if you work on gas flow, for example, gas problem. There is also Weymouth equations, similar kind of nonlinearities, right? So when you have this kind of nonlinearity, the first things you think of is that, okay, I like to use piecewise linearization. I like for every single uh, piece, I like to have a binary value, right? And then you have, I don't know, 24 hours, you have 1,000 scenarios, no problem. We can have, I don't know, 10,000 binaries. Can I solve it? No. Right? But that's the first thing one can think of. Nonlinearity, I use piecewise linear approximation. So I like to fast, sorry. So what, uh, what they did in this conference paper, they tried to see that how many segments, pieces we need to have to see that, okay, after that, we are fine. But the wonderful results that they just they, the mathematical expression, uh, Manuel de Paul, they, they write is this. So they said that, okay, you need to forecast day ahead price for tomorrow. If your day ahead price tomorrow is in this band, which depends on the efficiency of electrolyzer, uh, the hydrogen price, the capacity of the electrolyzer, and the standby consumption. So you can derive upper and lower bounds for day head price if your forecast is within that bound. So you have to be very careful how you are modeling your, your electrolyzer. Details matter. But if your forecast for tomorrow is outside this bound, fine. Either you are going to operate your electrolyzer at full capacity or minimal operation level. So you don't need to be very careful about the modeling of electrolyzer. So this gives you a priori, an idea, do you want to model your electrolyzer carefully or not? Right? So if you think it's a good idea, read it. I wouldn't like to show you results, sorry, but you have the, the slides. Uh, so linear, piecewise linear approximation. Imagine that you forecast for day price tomorrow is within the range, so you realize Details matter. If you model electrolyzer not carefully, you will lose money. Can we do better than piecewise linear approximation? You already saw the figure, right, for the efficiency. Can we do something better? Does it? Do you mind do something? Yes. Yes. It's fantastic. Yes. It's quadratic. What kind of constraint does it remind you? Yeah, quadratic constraint. What kind of programming? Second order cone, fantastic. Have you used second order cone programming? No, Your colleagues from RTE. Oh, yeah, of course, RTE. Uh, any of you knows about conic programming for ACOP? Have you used, yeah? Okay. For any other problem, have you used conic programming for? Yeah, for ACOP. For ACOP. Any? Yeah, not ACOP. <laughs> for, what? for local, for local bits, so it's, it's yeah, but for DC. Okay, we, we can talk later. Then. Uh, <laughs> yes, sure. for, for what? For the price taker, the price taker. 
okay, there should be some quadratic constraint that you relax it and make it conic constraint, right? So let's see. Yes, it's Lesia's PhD. Read it. Fantastic job she did. Uh, she modeled heat flow, heat flow using conic constraints. Also for gas, we can do that, right? So, I have to be fast. Okay. What Yannick and Anda and, and, uh, uh, and Erika did is this. What they did, they fit. I mean, the black one is the original one. The blue one, the one, the quadratic constraint they fed in a way that its maximum is the same as the maximum of the black one, the original one, right? So then you can write your, then your efficiency, right? Your efficiency constraint so that uh, at least hydrogen and production, you can sell it as a quadratic equation. I don't know, for example, it is equal to a p squared plus b p plus c, right? This kind of constraint. So, so now we have the blue dotted one. Now you can put it in your constraint. Is there any pieces, linear pieces? No. Do you need binary? No. But do we have problem here or not? Put it in the constraint. Are we happy? Convex optimization forces, could you take? Yes? Is it convex constraint or non-convex constraint? It's non-convex. Equality constraint should be linear. If it's not linear, it's non-convex. It's equality. It's, qu it's quadratic non-convex. So what do we do that? We relax it. We make it inequality. Then th that's the reason the blue shaded area, it now becomes a part of a visible space for the optimization problem. I have five minutes left. So, now it's a convex problem, but if your solution, for example, is in the shaded area, then your relaxation is not exact anymore. Your solution is optimal, but not feasible, not uh, without fidelity to the original problem. It's optimal, but not feasible, so who cares? Right? So, I read the paper. Uh, Yannick and Erika did the perfect job. They proved mathematically under prevalent, very common operational circumstances that that relaxation is exact. It means that although your optimization problem solves inequality, but when you solve it, the constraint is binding. It means that the right and left hand side they are equal. You relaxed it, but it's binding. Okay? So, yeah, read the paper. I can't tell more than that. Uh, I told you about frequency. Again, uh, you can read some papers here, but I like to be very fast. Otherwise, this here will complain. Yeah? You will. Uh, just I like, so you, you have these slides, you will see that. But just I like to show is this. So Andrea, who is preparing Friday bar now, uh, she did some analysis. If you have electrolyzer in EK1, like Sinesca Meza site, and if in 2021 you were like God, as Kwame said, and you had perfect foresight into price, so you know all the price, like a God, right? If you only participate, if you only sell hydrogen and power, then it becomes the purple one. That will be the evolution of your profit over the year. It means that at the end of the year, you have 6.9 uh, million krona. That's your, your revenue or profit, I don't remember, right? Profit, exposed profit. But then she showed that if you participate in, in uh, ancillary service markets, FCR and MFRR, and if you have everything perfect foresight, the red one, your profit from 6.9 could increase to 11.8. So it means that by participating in flexibility markets, the electrolyzer's profit in 2021, assuming that you are God know all the prices perfectly, could increase by 71%. That's a lot. 
The same goes for factoring them. I'm not saying for factoring, it will be exactly 71, but definitely also for the its, its signature. Right? So this means that if you do a good stochastic job, stochastic programming, 11.8 is Oracle, the best you can get. Most likely you will not get it because you don't have a perfect forecast. But your, your profit will be something between 6.9, if your forecast is not horrible, hopefully, and 11.8, right? And depending how good your forecast is, you will be somewhere between. <coughs> yeah. George, you have a question? The fluctuations. Now, there are a lot of details. Uh, if, if, if it's fine, you can discuss that offline. Because I like to, in the, in the remaining one hour, I like to show it. Important things. We will discuss that offline. Good. So you can read the paper. And the last thing, so far, whatever I told you is deterministic. Now we are doing some data driven stuff. So when we said, I'm very happy that I'm teaching this after Kwame's talk. So we can use data to make better decisions. Either you can make your problem stochastic. So based on all the historical data and observations you have, you can have a stochastic probability forecast. You can make it either scenarios, ah, you know, what problems we have in scenarios, if you do too many, if too many computational uh, problems, or you can make it uh, answer thing instead, you can solve your class optimization, conservative, or you can do a fantastic job as Lesia thought, you can define ambiguity sets and you can solve distribution robust optimization, right? That's what I'm going to do. Or, you can use data, and as one we said, plug it directly to kind of match and make right? For example, you can go for value-oriented value regression, or you can go for for the or something like that, and that's what Alice is trying to do, right? So, uh, remember the panel from second day, right? OR versus AI. We have kind of, let's say, debate between Andrea and Alice uh, in our group. So let's see if we have a real problem, and we will see which of them, which of them can gain more power, more money uh, to our students. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's that's us. We are trying to make money from there, not for us. Lesia, Alice, Andrea, and me, and the best people. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the project we are working there. So as I told you, we have... This guideline, we have seven, eight markets that we can participate. Each of them is like a revenue stream for us. Electricity price, wind generation, hydrogen price, all of them you have to forecast. I already showed you that there are even more. And also ancillary services markets, you have to forecast their prices. So what we try to do is that from all the historical data, for example, the last 100 days, why 100? We have to check it out. It's not necessarily 100, it's the optimal amount of data. So what we are trying is that we are trying to learn to see what kind of, what is the distribution of our forecast errors are. So then we can see what is our current forecast. What for that forecast level, for example, you say that for tomorrow, a specific hour, my forecast for wind power is 10 megawatt. So then maybe we can look at back and see when the, the forecast was in the same area, what was the forecast error distribution is. Right? Something like that. But are we sure about the distribution? Not necessarily. And that's why we are trying to generate a setup, a family, of potential distribution for forecast errors, make it ambiguity set and solve it uh, as uh, as a distribution of the bus problem. So uh, Yannick and Andrea recently they supervised a couple of uh, brilliant master students with the same amount of data, and we saw that there are circumstances that distribution of bus optimization can outperform SAA sample average approximation. So when I told it to Daniel Kuhn, he became super happy. Oh, yeah, yeah, and then see the results. Because he invented the model, and he likes to see that, yeah, it works in practice. Uh, yes, my last slide. I was very fast. <laughs>
It's my personal record talking all these things in one hour. Uh, physics are important. It doesn't matter what asset you are working on, neutralizer, <coughs> battery, thermostatically controlled loads, buildings, whatever. Make sure that you, you, you model the physics of the asset proper. But maybe there are conditions that we don't need to have careful modeling of the physics. So please try to think under which conditions physics matters, detailed modeling of the physics, and in what conditions it doesn't. So if there are conditions that, in, that proper modeling of physics is not important, then don't go to yourself. You are going to sell this method to industry. They love simplicity. That's the physics, my message about physics. The second one, multi-market. So these days, there are a lot of assets that they can participate in different markets. And even there are products that we have more than one market for that. For example, it's your head. You don't know, right? So portfolio management problem becomes super, super important. So uh, there are a lot of works done in other disciplines like operations research, uh, management science about portfolio management. But the type of the problem we have these days is complex. So it's important for us to talk to them and learn from them. And maybe our problems, they are harder than what they, they already uh, solved. So that's a good area to work these days. And uncertainty, as I mentioned, there are a lot of problems with uncertainty we have. You don't need to necessarily so, uh, handle uncertainty by stochastic programming. Machine learning might help, and there is a good chance that it may help. Uh, and then we have a lot of issues with uncertainty about high dimensionality, about non-stationarity, about conditionality. So, so there are a lot of. So today, to be honest, I gave you more questions than answers. There are a lot of questions that we haven't answered yet. So we need brilliant minds like you to be able to solve it, right? So thank you. <laughs>